down I'm the mountain turned around And I saw my reflection from the snow-covered hills To the fans that brought me down Well, with open minds and open hearts, let us have eyes to hear, eyes to see, <laughs> ears to hear that the kingdom of God is here. Let us pray. In this hour and place, may our soul hear the voice and wisdom of the Spirit speaking and giving gesture in every moment through the words and the music and the presence of all who are gathered here in this chapel. We welcome the Spirit to come and fill our lives with inspiration, with power, with courage, so that we can be people of powerful, overwhelming peace on earth. Amen. You may greet those whom you're seated near.
Well, welcome, welcome. So welcome to all of you, a special welcome to those who are here for the first time or here for uh, one of the first times. A big welcome to Dana Lawrence. She has traveled all the way from Highland Park, so, uh, but we are thankful for her. And a special, uh, I'm just going to throw this in the announcements and not make too big of a deal of it, but Lydia and I wanted to give a uh, gift to the community church, uh, being that this is one year pretty much to the day that we've been here. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so we, we uh, gifted this peace pole, and this guy is going to go out in front of the church office. We'll see if this makes any waves. I don't know. That's not intended. But uh, th these peace poles started after World War II in Japan. And so traditionally, they have a Japanese placard on them, and they say, may peace prevail on earth. Usually, it's good to have... If you're in an English-speaking country, English on there, so people know what they're looking at. Uh, the other languages uh, on this one, and you can get pretty much any language in the world. Um, this is Lakota, uh, Urdu, and Vietnam Vietnamese. Um, so that, that will be out. The first time I saw one of these peace poles was in front of a sushi restaurant in Boulder, and I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. Uh, but they are in front of churches, and they are in front of synagogues, you know. Um, so uh, we'll see how that looks, and a thanks to Bob Broughton, who did the uh, work on it, the copper top and the whole bit. So. And, you know, while there could be several things to... Uh, announced this morning the, uh, the highlight of these welcome announcements is going to be Cindy Corrigan. And Cindy Corrigan is uh, on the board of directors here at the community church. And uh, she's a lot of things, uh, but we are thankful for uh, her leadership uh, and the words that she has for us this morning. Good morning. For those that um, don't know me, um, I don't like to publicly speak, and I don't like to talk about money. So I'm not going to talk about money. I am going to give our, myself, my family's journey to the community church. Some of it may resonate with you, and others, I know you have your own personal reasons. But um, Tom asked this, and he's a really hard person to say no to, just because I don't think he ever says no. So here we go. Um, short and to the point, the path that brought us to the community church and has kept us here, both my husband John and I, who couldn't be here today, were raised in a pretty traditional Catholic environment. Um, John went through 12 years of Catholic school. We were married by his cousin Vic, who was a Catholic priest. He had nuns in the family. Um, a lot of Catholic going on there. So I never really questioned it. We, we got married. We talked a little bit about raising our children and didn't think about deviating from what we knew. And so we marched on. And um, we, we went to Saturday or Sunday Mass, admittedly, whichever was most convenient that particular week. And sometimes we'd switch churches just to, unfortunately, hit our schedule. Uh, and at one point, and I think the boys were pretty young, um, a friend invited us to the community church. And it, it happened to be at Croya. So for those of you who are newer, at one point in time, we, I think once a quarter, we used the space at Croya because the space was occupied. And so we went and we walked out and we thought, well, the music's really good and the people seem <laughs> friendly and, and Tom seems like a, an approachable, nice guy. And so we kind of straddled the two for a while. And then my husband had a, 
a health bump in the road. And at that point, he stopped and he said, you know, something's not working. This whole faith thing, it's, it's not working for me. And he, he went through surgery, and Tom was there. Tom didn't know us. He didn't know John. But he, he was there before, after, uh, during. And that meant a lot. He, didn't, he wasn't there because he wanted us to come to church. He was there because he cared. And so we continued after that, and everything turned out very well. And we continued to, to go to the community church more and more frequently. And I don't know how long we've been here. I tried to figure that out from records. I have no idea. It's been six, it's been eight years, but it's become our home. And it's like putting on a warm glove on a cold day. It feels right. So the second Christmas we were here, I invited my mom, my mom who raised me Catholic and it was a devout Catholic. And she, um, I told her we're going to go to Mass on Christmas Eve, and if you want, I will go to um, the Catholic Church with you on Sunday. And so she came, and um, if you haven't been, I hope you have the opportunity. It's a beautiful service. It's peaceful, and it's, it's just beautiful. And so we left, and I said, Mom, what would you think? And she said, oh, honey, it was, it was nice, but it didn't really count, did it? And I said, oh, God. And I shared this with Tom, and he, he's like, I've heard it before. It's okay. So I, didn't, I wasn't going to take my mom to task at that point because she was letting me off the hook for Sunday. And I'm like, okay, what, we're good. But, but it made me pause, maybe not at that moment, but as I was preparing some thoughts for today, I said, well, what, what makes it count? What makes it relevant for us today? And so I'm going to list off a couple. Maybe they're obvious. Maybe they're personal higher level ideas that work for us. And hopefully some of them work for you, but you're here for a reason. Everybody has things to do and you're coming. You're choosing to come on, on Sunday. So is it the music? It's incredible. And there are some Sundays where it just takes me to a different place and that's okay. Or is it the relevant sermon that Zach or Tom deliver that just hits home and it allows me or you to get through the week because we live in a really crazy world. Or sometimes it's a personal message and you feel like, have they been sitting in my family room? Are they listening to me? That, that one was for me. There, there are new friends that we've developed and there's friendly faces every time you walk in and that makes it home. It's low pressure, it's always instilled with humor and that's real. Is it the service work that adults, our high school children, and even the younger children do to give back to those that have so much less than we do? And I asked Patrick, um, my 17-year-old, who's not here today, I said, what, what do you think is different about, and he barely remembers going to the Catholic Church, but the formal, more structured church, what do you think is different about that versus the community church? And he said, well, I think people go there because they feel obligated. But at the community church, I think people really want to be there. They want to be part of it. And so that's why it counts for us. That's the meaning it has for us. And I'm hoping and I kind of believe that you have your own personal reasons. And here's the plug. Hopefully, those reasons will allow us to count on you for this annual fund. Thank you. So that I 
talking about the music that would be played, uh, sort of deliberating, like I said, Dana, just one, maybe a fifth song, uh, more music, less preaching, though this sermon's a little long. Um, and she said she was going to play a Ben Harper song, and I said, oh, I, and I, I thought Dana, maybe, I didn't know who she was, no, I never met her, I emailed back, oh, I saw Ben Harper in 95. Uh, at the Fox Theater in Boulder. And she wrote back, I was at that show. <laughs> so it's a small world. Yeah. Uh, the scripture this morning, I'm going to take from, uh, it's a Sermon on the Mount. So we should all be familiar with it. If you're not familiar with it, you can get familiar with it starting today. Uh, but it's taken from the translation by Reverend Clarence Jordan, uh, he was also a New Testament scholar, so it's um, a responsible but different uh, translation. He, he started an organization called Koinonia Farm in Georgia, uh, and Koinonia Farm was one of the first uh, integrated interracial communities uh, in America. Uh, this was in the 50s, 60s, maybe even the 40s. They were bombed more than once for the, for the reason that they were uh, integrated, an integrated community. Uh, that community birthed what is now Habitat for Humanity. Uh, so here's how he puts the Sermon on the Mount. When Jesus saw the large crowd, he went up the hill and sat down. His students gathered around him, and he began teaching them. This is what he said. The spiritually humble are God's people, for they are citizens of his new order. They who are deeply concerned are God's people, 
for they will see their ideas become reality. They who are gentle are God's people, for they will be partners across the land. They who have unsatisfied appetite for the right are God's people, for they will be given plenty to chew on. The generous are God's people, for they will be treated generously. Those whose motives are pure are God's people, for they will have spiritual insight. People of peace and goodwill are God's people, for they will be known throughout the land as God's children. Those who have endured much for what is right are God's people, <clears throat> citizens of God's new order. Or to put it in Martin Luther King's organization and principles of nonviolence, they are citizens of the beloved community, or they are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Several years ago, I visited my sister's fourth grade classroom where she was teaching in central Los Angeles. Uh, sa actually, south uh, Los Angeles, the Watts neighborhood. It's where the Watts Towers are, if you're familiar with that. 100% African American classroom, except for my sister. When I departed the classroom, uh, the kids said to my sister with sort of surprise, Miss Tate, your brother's a honky. <laughs> um, my sister uh, explained that, uh, I think I knew this, but she explains that challenged neighborhoods, they tend to see white women who come in and work as social workers, teachers, NGO leaders, but not many white men. And so white men, not being so prevalent, are seen as outsiders. And they get an outsider's name, uh, and I got the outsider's name. Uh, now, outsider or not, most people tend to agree that I am the epitome of the whitest guy on earth. Uh, and I, can't, I, I want to reject that, but I don't think I have much standing to. Uh, and they aren't, may I add, complimenting me. Um, I haven't had a single tan in my whole life. Not because I don't want one. I can't get one. I get freckles. Um, I'm not so much white as just pink. That's really what I am. All this has a point. Last Friday, uh, I took my pink self down to the Austin neighborhood on the west side of Chicago uh, to attend a nonviolence non workshop with the Institute for Nonviolence of Chicago. Uh, Institute board member Eleanor Janata uh, attended with me, or I attended with her, and together we constituted two of the four or five uh, pink people in the room uh, of 50 or 60, and I was easily the pinkest of us. Um, suffice to say, I stood out. And part of my experience that day, aside from all the good information that we were exposed to, was having the opportunity to catch a face-to-face -face, uh, glimpse of the world from the perspective of black folks. Uh, the training started with a series of skits demonstrating Mar Martin Luther King's principles and the nonviolence uh, non of Chicago's principles of nonviolence. Uh, they are principles inspired by the teaching and example of Christ and learned and refined from MLK's time spent with Gandhi. Uh, one of the skits involved Tenny Gross. Some of you may be remember Tenny, uh, the executive director of Nonviolent Chicago. He was here last spring speaking to the uh, 
was at the women's dinner. Uh, and one of the skits involved Tinny. Uh, and so he's an Israeli from Boston. Uh, he speaks with a kind of a Boston, Eastern European accent. Uh, and he incidentally does a horrendous uh, West Side homeboy accent. He, uh, in one of the skits, Tinny, presuming to be a part of the culture that the skit portrays, entered the room and says, uh, hey guys, what's happening? Uh, replete with, like, nux, you know, uh, in a Cubs hat, no less. And I'm thinking, where's wardrobe? He at least needs a White Sox hat, maybe. But I think maybe he was trying to break stereotypes. Um, that's his excuse. Now, the skits were quite powerful, uh, depicting, should we say, normal scenes from violent neighborhoods like Austin, uh, such as this scene, a family's daughter is dating a drug dealer. And the brother, who's recently released from jail, uh, is protesting this relationship because it puts his sister in too close proximity to, to violence, really. Um, the mom, the family, and I'm changing the story slightly because it's complex to make it clear. The mom, the family, is taking money uh, from the boyfriend to pay household bills. Uh, heads in the room are nodding that indeed this kind of situation is normal. Uh, the skits, though, were more than stories of the way things are for black folks in challenging neighborhoods in Chicago. They tell and told a universal story of personal and family struggle with violence, spiritual violence, uh, emotional violence, physical violence that we can all relate to um, in our own ways. Um, even when the details of socioeconomics and race certainly differ. So the purpose of nonviolence and peacemaking is the creation of the beloved community. And that's a phrase that is embedded in King's nonviolent, six nonviolent principles, you could say that's the, the beloved community is the kingdom of heaven amongst us. Um, it's principle two in the principles of nonviolence. The beloved community where everyone is treated equally with respect and love. Heaven breaking into earth. Now, Tinney shared, uh, after his bad acting was over, he shared, that was supposed to be a laugh line. <laughs> um, he shared a profound piece of wisdom uh, that I'll pass on. An Afrikaans woman, a white woman in South Africa, was significantly involved in the struggle against apartheid there. And she was championed as a great ally of the black community. Sounds about right. But in response, the woman said, I'm not an ally. I'm a fellow human in the family of humanity. We are one. If one part of the body is hurt, the whole body hurts. You see, I'm coming to the aid of my own body. The nonviolence workshop concluded with a documentary film about what history remembers as the Birmingham Children's Crusade of May 1963. It sparked a turning point in the civil rights movement. You may not know it by that name, but you've seen probably the footage if you've been around long enough. Uh, the purpose of this march, this children's march, uh, was to walk downtown to appeal to the mayor's office 
to get a hearing about segregation in the city. Thousands of children peaceably marched through the streets of Birmingham, and they were summarily hosed down, high-pressure fire department hoses. They were menaced by police dogs, uh, and they were beaten with batons by Birmingham's finest. And over the four days of marching, all of which started from 16th Street Baptist Church, thousands of kids got locked up in the Birmingham jails uh, to overflowing. The lawful reason given for locking up these kids was parading without a permit. Um, which is pretty funny and outlandish. President JFK, to his credit, so moved by the image and appalled by the images coming from Birmingham uh, that he proposed the Civil Rights Act of 1963 on television uh, June 11th, just a month or so later. Four months later, 16th Street Baptist Church was bombed by KKK members, killing four little girls and injuring 22 others. And then six months after the march, JFK was assassinated. Uh, principle one of King's nonviolence principles is nonviolence is a way of life for courageous people. And I think of immediately Martin Luther King, Gandhi, both assassinated, Christ executed. Uh, you know, and in both cases, pretty much by the state. Um, principle two, creation of the beloved community. Principle three, nonviolence seeks to defeat forces of evil, not people doing evil. Pretty significant. Principle four, the acceptance of suffering without retaliation, because suffering transforms and educates. Principle five, nonviolence chooses love instead of hate. And principle six, and this is kind of where faith comes in, the universe is on the side of justice. Martin Luther King said, though the arc of justice is long, the arc, rather the arc of the universe is long, it bends towards justice. Do we believe that? Uh, this is a man who dreamed of a better day, had faith in a better day, because of his theology, because he believed that the spirit, the author, sustainer of the universe, is just. Sometimes it's hard to believe. You and I and we, outside these doors, with our words and actions, being open to the spirit, the same spirit that filled Christ, Martin Luther King, Gandhi, can hasten this bending towards justice every day. At the conclusion of the documentary film, the room that Eleanor and I were sitting in was asked for responses. I raised my hand, sort of with a little trepidation about what I was feeling, and heads and eyes turned my way, and I immediately felt very white. Uh, and somehow very out of place, and very removed from what most of the people in the room no doubt were feeling during the documentary as they rewatched the events of a horrific event that happened and happens to fellow African Americans because of the color of their skin. They watch in a way that I never can. And I felt a little bit of that washing up on me. Uh, I said that I felt humbled to watch the film in that room, 
And though I had seen the footage before, I'd never seen it in the context of Austin High School. And to see it in the con in context of Austin High School in that neighborhood is to see the footage really for the first time. Uh, a man named Yusuf, who is as black in color as I am white, he said to me in so many words after I shared, the white people in the film were told from the cradle that they were better because of the color of their skin. It wasn't their fault. They were lied to. Yusef's words were at once relieving, full of hope, and somehow deeply convicting at the same time. And Yusef's words reminded me of Christ's words upon the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Kind of encapsulated the six principles of nonviolence. I'll end with this story. In 2001, I went to the U2 show in Denver. It was the Elevation Tour. And a U2 show is always entertaining. I've never been to one that's not. You're about to hear a U2 song. They're always full of inspiration. Uh, they're full of showmanship because Bono's there. And they're full of conviction. And they're inspiring for action for a better world and a better life for all. Uh, I found myself during the show kind of daydreaming, uh, listening to the music, but thinking about all kinds of things that I was inspired for. Uh, so much so that I had the distinct thought, I just need to stop thinking and listen to the music. God knows I paid enough to be in this room. Uh, and after the show, I did a very uncharacteristic thing. I, uh, I went to the merchandise table, and I, I didn't know what I was going to find in here, but I bought sort of the program, or the YouTube propaganda. Uh, it's, mostly, it's mostly pictures, but there's content, and it's good. And I read the whole thing through right there at the show. And... The, it's, it's sort of set up in a question and answer with Bono and some of the, and the other band members. And uh, this last question to Bono affirmed my daydreaming experience. Uh, Bono was asked, what message do you have for someone reading this right after the show? I was like, what? How's that a question? Uh, because it just spoke to my experience right then. And Bono said, as the preacher says, make that call. Whether it's your mother, Amnesty International, or your best mate, do the things that came into your head when we were playing. Uh, as Dana plays the next song, one, listen to the lyrics. Pay attention to her, but also listen to your head and your heart. And maybe after this service, you might, as Bono says, have a call to make. Maybe a call to a loved one uh, to patch up old wounds, uh, or maybe a call to a supposed enemy uh, that you need to begin the process of peacemaking with. Or maybe a call to an outlandish project that you've been procrastinating uh, for love and peace, uh, hastening the arc of the universe. Uh, whatever it is, make the call. And may peace and the creation of the beloved community, heaven, begin with our own lives, in our own homes, in our community, and spread to all the world. Because we indeed are one. Thank you, Dana.
uh, for the generosity of you all that help make this uh, church not only happen on a Sunday morning, but happen every other day of the week. It's a burning thing And it makes a fiery ring Thank you, Dana. She will have a post lead for us before she does so. Receive this benediction. Sometime this week, see if you can't go to nonviolencechicago.org. Get on there and look at the several ways you can be involved in the effort uh, for nonviolence in Chicago. Here's a couple. Uh, this one, the first one's near and dear to me reading glasses for kids that need them. 
uh, you can help donate those. Uh, you can help donate uh, donuts for families who have lost someone and get donuts and coffee the morning after. Flowers uh, for memorial services for families who can't afford them. Uh, rewards, special rewards for students uh, at places like Austin High School and Orr Academy uh, who have good attendance and, uh, and good behavior. Uh, all of these things can help bring power, efficacy to nonviolence in Chicago. Go into the rest of today, into the rest of this week. Go and be peacemakers, and you will be the children of God. And all the people said, Amen. 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 Wake up, wake up, open your eyes, wake up, wake up.
Never too late to be. Hey.